And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the second edition of the realistic combat pa pen and paper RPG, known, known as Meteor Tales of Lore Untold, the one and only Angelos Kipanios. And I know I'm just, <laughs> I'll, I'll get it right eventually. <laughs> Hi. Hello there. How are you, do how are you doing? To well, I, get I guess it would be this evening on, on your end. Yep, yep. It's a uh, it's a bit late here, but uh, I'm fine mm -hmm. here in the uh, Athenian lockdown in Greece. And how are you? I am do I am doing good. Um, it's st it's starting to get a little bit chilly over here, but not nearly enough for my standards. That's probably not going to happen until next month. Um, yeah. When it get when it's gonna when it's gonna start getting into the teens and. I would convert that to to Celsius, but once it gets that low, does it really matter? All right. <laughs> it's it's still just going to be a case of stay the hell inside because nobody's going to want to go go in a cold go outside in a cold where um, just br just breathing out there is going is going to be a pain. Yeah, I understand. It is. So. I like to start with the humble beginnings, as, as it were, when it comes to the journey. When it comes to the journey that people have with RPGs. So, with okay. that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Yeah. Um, so, I grew up in an island, uh, a very small island of Greece, mm -hmm. and uh, when I was like eleven years old, um, I went to a friend's house, and my friends were older, like seven, eight years older than me. And they were already playing uh, the second edition of Dungeons & Dragons mm -hmm. back then. That's like, uh, I don't know, uh, 25 years back. And uh, so uh, they just recruited me and I started playing as well. I was 11 years old. I was barely, um, you know, um, managing to understand the, the whole thing. But I had some experience of video games, uh, role-playing games of the 90s uh, so uh, it wasn't completely unknown the whole thing so i started playing uh, 11 years old and because we lived in an island and there was nothing else to do we played every day for eight hours for years any years and uh, when i was like 13 years old i uh, i started creating my own uh, world and i don't know uh, you know, I, I was I started to um, um, adjust a few things in the already made systems of Dungeons and Dragons and other stuff mm -hmm. I would see, and then it started. You know, it became a habit, and uh, one thing led to another. And 20 years later, you know, the whole thing uh, became an obsession of uh, creating my own RPGs and uh, keep creating the the same world, the fantasy world I started creating mm -hmm. all these years ago. So yeah, because growing up in an island with nothing to do helped a lot. Uh, so we played every day yeah. for many, many years. It was amazing. <laughs> now, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to your your early exposures with um, with RPG, RPGs, were you were were you in the situation where you had where you were mostly doing D and D and just and just hacking that just hacking that or were there other systems that you dipped into over the years? To be honest, uh, when I was playing the A D and D system with my dungeon master, then he from from the from the first time we played, he didn't even have the original rules. He already had a homebrew custom thing of his own. Which was completely different. So I never got to play these classic systems a lot, apart from some video games like Baldur's Gate and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I never got to play them. But we got in the process of creating our own stuff right away. And then, to be honest, I was I was never really interested in playing many other systems, just because I was so involved in creating my own stuff and practicing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, creating systems and testing them 
became a very nice uh, obsession over the years. So I don't have much experience in many. I mean, I know I've studied some systems, but uh, for the for the sake of studying them, I haven't uh, you know played them organically like uh, you know uh, with a, uh, happened to play in many parties because I was always a storyteller. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to study systems just to see what they're made of and how they operate, how they function, and what their features are. But I never, um, uh, but I never played a lot in other systems, to be honest. Apart from uh, custom ones that friends made. For us, it was a very normal thing to create stuff and not play the already made ones for some reason. All right. Now, with the, with that in mind, was that how? Was that how Meteor Tales ended, ended up ended up getting created? Just, um, ha just hacking and hacking until you had something that was more of its own thing than anything resembling its source material. Yes, but at, at some point, uh, a few years back, I realized that I wanted to create something that I couldn't see in other systems from friends because, you know, when you are into RPGs, you meet you meet a lot of people and. You, social, you all the networks of people that play different systems and we talk about this and I, I noticed that I didn't see any systems that have this um, this element that I wanted to emphasize the realistic combat thing and I had a very good idea on how to make it so uh, yes it was a lot of uh, you know um, messing around with the system and uh, trying to give it a final form, but at some point I found the core element that I wanted to emphasize and I worked around that. And uh, from that moment it became much more specific because I want to create something that does not really exist or I don't know about. And um, I wanted to have a different kind of product that has something to offer, not just a system with different spells, different races, different stuff, you mm -hmm. know. I wanted a different concept because I didn't like the way that modern systems now, the aesthetic part of it, and uh, they have some sort, in my in my opinion, they have some sort of video game logic that I don't really like. And the way I see players uh, engage in the uh, in the game and how they treat their characters and how they they treat combat, I don't like it because it's a very video game logic. Like let's go hack and slash and. Uh, Oh, we have hit points, we can do that. We don't have hit points, we cannot do that. I, don't, I didn't like that kind of... Uh, I wanted a more hardcore uh, approach mm -hmm. to battle with uh, fear and uh, consequences <laughs> and realistic uh, elements. Yeah. In that regard, would you, would you say that Meteor Tales leans more, in the, leans more in the realms of sword and sorcery in terms of its style of fantasy? Well, I would... I would have to see what the styles are <laughs> to categorize it, but I, I guess it sounds um, it sounds right. I don't know. If you need a, if you need a few examples of um, representatives when it comes to sword and sorcery, the big um, the big one, of course, is the is the works of Robert E. Howard, namely Conan, um, Cole, and Solomon Kane. Um, yeah. The. Um, Elric of Milnibene from um, Michael Moorcock also ca also yeah. counts under this, as well as the as well as the works of Fritz Lieber, namely um, Fathford and the Grey Mauser. Okay. But with a lot of those, you don't you tend to not have the larger than life motifs that you'd see in a lot of higher or epic fa or epic fantasy, and it's more about people tr people trying to survive a um har a harsh. Um, a harsh setting and usually overcoming through through um, cunning. Yes, 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 yes. That sounds about right. It's uh, there's a there's a lot of survival going on in the game, and uh, I always emphasize that when people create characters and they're about to begin, and I always tell them that if you don't, if you if you're not careful enough, and if you don't pay attention to some uh, certain things, you're not gonna make it. It's not. There's no safety nets like in other RPGs, there, because there are no levels exactly, or mm -hmm. there are no hit points. And then, that, so the, the game doesn't have these safety nets when you say that, okay, I'm a 10th level character and I'm fighting a one, a first level monster. So there's really 
nothing to worry about. That does not exist. If you get ambushed, if you if you fire a lot, and if you uh, lower your guard for a while, uh, it's going to end up messy. It, that's the way the system is. It can be lethal right away. It's so like... develop, develop, developing your character more or less uh, helps you defend yourself better, but it doesn't make you indestructible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in the in that particular in that particular regard, um, a lot of a lot of times, game a lot of times different games will have a sort will have a sort of will have a sort of die mechanic that everything falls back on. I um. I, of, I often liken it to to the old to the old adage of all roads lead to Rome. Eh. Um, in regard to Meteor Tales, what would you say that system is? The what would you say the type of die roll that is the more consistent fallback more consistent fallback for the majority of rolls that you would have to do? If I understood correctly, that, does that mean uh, what kind of dice do you use mostly in the game? Is that the same sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's not very clear. Uh, I don't think I've made I've made a system where you use all uh, the, all all dice from the regular set, mm -hmm. uh, more or less, because uh, I don't know how you. Uh, I think it, it's called. Um, no, I don't know the term, but. You know, when you have, for example, an attribute like strength, for example, mm -hmm. if it's low, you use a die 4. If it's medium, you use a die 6. If it's high, you use a die 8. So it changes according to the level of some stuff. Yeah, that that would be a um that would be that would be a die that would be a die code that would be a die code system. I've and it's it's I'm not gonna, I'm not going to say it's um it's rare, but it's definitely one that is it's definitely a road that isn't traveled as much. Yeah. So I use uh, so I use this for a lot of stuff, even in skills, in attributes, in everything. I don't use a the one die I rarely use is d twenty. It never gets except from some very epic attributes. So. Uh, uh, Apart from that, I use all the other dice. I think more or less the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the medium one is, I mean, uh, die six is what uh, represents a medium attribute and a medium level of anything. So maybe it's more common. Maybe. Mm -hmm. And when I when I look at the when I look at the um, way skills are set up, would it be fair of me to to assume that any sort of skill roll is done with a percentile die? Yes. So for the uh, regular skills, yes, mm -hmm. I dis I didn't want to to use a um, skill level versus difficulty mode. Mm -hmm. I thought it, I I never liked that kind of gameplay. So I made a percentage thing, which just roll your percentage. And in that within within yeah. that is there, how would it, would um. Would attribute would straight attribute rolls be le be less common, or would it, or would it be a case where those are roll under as well? What, what kind of rolls? Do you hear you? Um, st straight attributes. Yeah. Um, you don't use attributes rolls all that often. I mean, because skills are not connected with attributes, mm -hmm. unlike other systems. So. You don't use uh, you don't use the attributes. To, to, uh, you can use some some checks related to attributes. For example, if you want to push a door, yes, you might wish to use might and force the door open. That's one occasion, but it doesn't happen really often. the uh, The role of the attributes is not that active, and uh, so they are not connected. What, what, what was the question again? Um. <laughs> whether or not whether or not um a fo whether or not a pro how like if some if it's now with each of the attributes it's mentioned um that that they have che that they have a yeah, die for checks um how would the, how would those be used in comparison to how skills are used okay attributes offer some uh, uh bonuses some modifiers and some you know, passive bonuses, of course, and they adjust some characteristics. And in terms of skills, and in terms of uh, checks, 
each attribute um, is responsible for a um, category of checks that might uh, uh, occur. And, it, and in that case, yes, it's a dice versus difficulty in that case. Mm -hmm. that's, what you, that's what you mean. Yes. So if you have a medium, I don't know, might, uh, and you want to force a door open, and you roll a dice six, it's going to be against a certain uh, modifier, a certain uh, difficulty. Mm -hmm. And with it, now when it comes to, I know you mentioned that you're not go that you're not going with classes, but what I'm curious about is how the how the path system that you have works. Okay, so you you choose a path, okay, and that gives you a sense of direction and what your character is about, apart from the other steps. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you develop that path, uh, but at your own pace. And uh, the whole, I think the the whole thing that is worth mentioning about uh, this chapter is that uh, the experience required to develop to the next uh, step, because there are no levels, there's just amounts of experience, is that uh, you develop at your own pace by practicing in-game. Mm -hmm. You don't get awarded by the storyteller. So, for example, if you're a knight and uh, you want to get better, so you just uh, do a sparring session with another party member or you practice on your own mm -hmm. or you practice with a teacher and uh, I've created tables that offer different bonuses according to the teaching st to the to the learning style. So a teacher is more effective than sparring alone or practicing alone, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this way, players get to get to role play a lot. Just for this mechanic only, they get to synchronize the sparring sessions. They sat, they say, they 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 find um, free free time within a day of uh, actual adventuring in order to to dedicate that to developing their characters, which is very nice. Before they rest, they say, okay, let's practice for one hour because we need to get better. We need to sharpen our skills and stuff like that. And uh, so it creates a lot of uh, role-playing opportunities mm -hmm. and allows the players to have a sense of freedom when it comes to development. Yeah. So if they want to develop faster, they just practice more. But of course, there are mechanics that can hold you back Mm -hmm. There's an attribute called willpower that allows you, depending on the level of that, it allows you to to dedicate a number of um, effective hours, that's how we call it. Mm -hmm. So if you have medium willpower, for example, you may use up to three hours of training in whatever area you wish, and something like that. All right. Now... One of the th one of the th one of the things that ha that has been the has been a major claim to fame with the Meteor Tales system is its approach to combat, and you're going for a, you you're going for a more realistic ap approach. And before before I get into the nitty gritty of how of how it works, I'm curious yeah. how th how this sum started and what you and what you were trying to address. Yeah, what I'm what I'm was trying to address. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean what I mean by realistic combat? Yeah, since realistic uh, can mean a lot of can mean a lot of things to yeah, a lot yeah. of people. Okay, okay, that's a fair question. Um, for me, it means uh, it's a combat system that is highly interactive. Uh, it is, of course, turn based, but it's made in a way that doesn't doesn't feel turn based, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna explain what that means, and uh, and um, it it uses it uses some mechanics that um, I think it's called something like resource management because you have to focus a lot on your stamina, and you have to to be aware of what you, your character is wearing, uh, the equipment he's holding, the weight because the weight plays an important role. And uh, it, it emulates a sort of combat, um, how it would work in the natural world. 
how a character that uses light armor versus a character that uses heavy armor. And uh, I wanted to create a, um, a sense that I don't see in other games. When you, when, you know, uh, every weapon you use and every weapon you choose um, is, um, plays an important role because I see people playing games that they forget to change weapons mm -hmm. apart from modifiers and uh, magic and stuff like that. And they can, you know, finish whole campaigns with just one weapon, and that doesn't make sense in a in a realistic combat environment because there are many occasions that you have to switch to a smaller weapon or a ranged weapon, stuff like that. And I wanted to emphasize that, mm -hmm. so I, I I figured out some mechanics that allow you to that force you to change between weapons and uh, force you to 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 think about the weight of the weapon and the, and the size of the weapon and uh, how your character moves and how uh, and how much stamina he has and how and, and if he runs out of breath mm -hmm. uh, what can he do next and uh, stuff like that so it, it, it forces you into a strategy that uh, cre creates a realistic approach and uh, of course the key element is the action versus reaction rule that I've uh, implemented and uh, I think the stamina and the interactive gameplay is what makes the combat realistic. And of course, the little system without the hit points. All right, I can, I can, cer I can certainly get, I can certainly get that. And that's definitely something that I did that I didn't, that I didn't see when I was, when I was looking into it. What was a la was a lack of. Um, a lack of hit, a lack of hit points in the tr in a traditional approach, and I'm get, I'm guessing that in, I'm guessing that instead of that, you're going for a more wound based approach with the yes, combat wound. locations. Yes, 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 because you have you have the uh, anatomy of each target, and uh, you I have also uh, I also have anatomy dice for every strike where it lands and what uh, what has happened, what happens when a strike lands on the on the arm, on the leg, on the torso. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got some side effects from uh, for flesh wounds, severe wounds, little wounds, and so on and so forth. And uh, yes, so you have a, s a certain threshold for each character instead of hit points, but that doesn't change. It's the same. It doesn't change with levels or something like that. It doesn't. I mean, the the better you get as a character, you get to defend yourself better, mm -hmm. to block strikes, to evade. To dodge and stuff like that, uh, but you don't get to um, to suffer more damage. Uh, if you get hit, it's the same thing, regardless of level. Right, I can I can go with that. And when it comes to when it comes to roll when it comes to rolls, um, I know some games will have some. Um, variation of crit of criticals or some cases where the where the right dice roll can lead to a can lead to a spike in effect is that something that you're going to be doing or it or is that not going to be the case yes i've got critical hits but mm -hmm. uh, they're not on the um, attack roll because we don't have an attack roll mm -hmm. when you when you attack someone the other the target is entitled to a reaction, so it's a contested role between them. And uh, if your strike succeeds, you roll for anatomy, and then you roll for damage. When you roll for damage, if you hit the highest uh, number on the dice, then it's a critical hit. The maximum damage is a critical hit, and it comes with an extra effect. Let me give you an example. If you're using a slashing weapon, mm -hmm. if you're using a long sword. Uh, and you let's say that your damage is one die eight, and you roll an eight, and uh, you attack a target's uh, torso. The critical effect would be a laceration, which which means that you get to roll an anatomy roll again, and uh, uh, perform some damage to another body member as a to a second part of the body. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Did I say it correctly? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, oftentimes when I've when I've seen action and reaction systems, especially ones that are relying on stamina, um, 
there's been cases where um where reactions are ju are just to draw on the resource just as much as actions do is that going to be the case here or is or um is it a case where reactions are all, are are always a um, option i uh i struggle a lot with this and i changed a lot of opinions before the final form of the whole thing and uh I ended up having a, a formula that uh, covered everything I wanted in terms of action and reaction. So uh, there are two types of reactions. Mm -hmm. One is called a natural reaction and the other is called a focused reaction. So a natural reaction is when someone uh, attacks you in melee and you get to have a set of choices. Uh, you can do actually anything you want but not everything is going to be as effective. So, for example, if a person with a long sword attacks another character in melee, you can block, you can parry, you can jump, you can evade, you can do, you can cast a spell, you can do whatever you want as a reaction. Mm -hmm. And if you, and if, and if you succeed in the role, in the contested role, um, in some cases you're going to prevail, but in some other cases. Uh, you, you're just gonna, um, for example, if I choose to block and I make the roll, I block the attack successfully, and that's the end of it. But if I choose to attack when someone attacks me, even if I succeed, if I even if I prevail in the roll, we're gonna we're both gonna attack each other and we're both gonna suffer damage. Uh, it's not as effective, mm. but. A focused reaction is when your character, on his own, in his own turn, decides to forfeit his turn and focus on another character. When that happens, you forfeit your turn, you focus on another character, and when the other character gets to play, you call your reaction then. And if you do that, you may you get you get to interrupt them. It's a more it's a much more effective reaction. So you can do whatever you want. In, in terms of reactions, mm -hmm. but in some cases they are very effective and they will interrupt the other target, and in some other cases they are not as effective. And the best case scenario is for both events to occur. For example, let me give you another example. Uh, if you cast a petrify spell, and my reaction is to attack you at the same time, in one scenario, my my attack is going to interrupt your spell, and in the other scenario. Both events will occur, and I will get petrified, and you will get attacked at the same time. Oh, all right, that that definitely makes sense. And I'm get um, I'm guessing that that there's going that there's going to be a difference in effect if somebody's using a slashing weapon versus if they're using a bludgeoning or piercing weapon. It's not so much a matter of weapons; it's a matter of a. Uh, it's a matter of speed. So yes, some some spells and items have an, an element that 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 deem them fast, and everything that is fast is very effective in terms of reaction. It's a it, there's some mechanics that uh, help you distinguish uh, between uh, choices when it comes to reactions. So yeah, you have to be very strategic about that. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the th one of the th now I realize that um, that this is a, that this is a game that is that is largely going to be focused on the, on that particular approach. But given that we had, you had mentioned before that it's that it's leaning more in the realm of of sword and sorcery approaches, I'm cur I'm curious as to how the game is going to handle magic. Yeah. Um... I created a. I'm re, I'm really proud of the magic system that I created. To be honest, I um, there are certain schools of magic, of course, which is uh, it's not a new thing. But uh, the thing is that each school of magic has a mini system. Uh, so, depending on the spellcaster you choose, you have to learn the mechanics of each school of magic. For example, um, you use. You need catalysts to cast spells. Spells require stamina, so you use stamina for both fighters and spellcasters. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's the currency that fuels everything. So you use stamina, and in the same sense, 
if a sportcaster is wearing armor and heavy equipment, he has a lot of weight on him. So he needs more stamina. So you have the same balance between sportcasters and warriors and heavy armor stuff. And um, so in order, in order to use spells, you use catalysts. But each school of magic has a different system when it comes to finding these catalysts and uh, utilizing them. For example, uh, druids find uh, catalysts within uh, nature and spells. For example, you find a frog, you kill the frog, and you extract a jump spell from the frog. And then you use the frog's blood as a catalyst to, to have a number of charges for this particular spell. Mm -hmm. And then you kill a lion, for example, and you, you, you extract a, I don't know, a lion a fury spell. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, you need the lion's blood mm -hmm. as a catalyst for a number of charges. So this is a small uh, system uh, for, for this spellcaster alone. So the druid must go out in nature, find animals, extract spells from them, and gather catalysts by uh, uh, using uh, their blood. And uh, that's one way. For the psionic, which is a different school of magic, mm -hmm. uh, he gets spells by meditating. He unlocks them from within. So he performs a meditation skill, and uh, if successful, he unlocks one spell, and then he has to meditate again to create charges of spell use for this spell. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different thing. And then, so there are like, I don't know, 10, 12 schools of magic, and each one of them operates completely differently. Now, when it comes when it comes to the no when it comes to the notion of, ha would it be fair to say that most of the spell most of the spell casting use revolves around char revolves around charges? Um, yes, charges. Yes, uh, I think it's uh, safe to say charges and stamina. Okay. And uh, each school of magic has two uh, categories: um, spells and rituals. And when I say rituals. Rituals that are out of combat, uh, spells of uh, that have greater effects, that are not so much combat related, of course. Um, they have bigger effects that affect, you know, um, a large area or uh, I don't. It's bigger scale spells, anyways. Mm -hmm. More related to role playing and utility than combat. Now, and part part of the reason part of the reason I asked when it when it comes to that kind of thing is I'm tr is I'm trying to ascertain how similar or different this would be to the Va to the Vancian model. And given the fact that you have to use stamina and charges, and that it already disqualifies itself from some parts of it, but in another sense, I'm guessing that th that because of the way the spell casting system works. This isn't going to be a situation where you can get charges back by taking an eight-hour rest like you could in um, D and D. No, no, no. You have to do stuff. Mm -hmm. You have to do stuff. Uh, resting is not going to cut it. Uh, you have to go after stuff. I, I, and I made that on purpose because I want, in the same sense that people uh, practice to get better in sword fighting, spellcasters must uh, go out of their way to locate stuff or find stuff. Uh, so it's a, it's kind of a side quest every time. Yeah. And when it, com when it comes to the spells, are they very, are individual spells very fire and forget, or is there the possibility for someone to customize a, a spell? Um, there's, um, there are some power-ups that you gain as you develop as a spellcaster when you get, where you get to adjust certain elements, yes. So you get some add-ons that you can insert at the time of the spell casting and uh, change a bit the spell, actually, uh, or maximize its effect or differentiate a bit. Or um, So yes, you get to customize through mm -hmm. specific templates, of course, the spell in uh, certain ways. And also you get some uh, power-ups that you can um, apply to them in a more permanent basis. So each spellcaster can customize some spells at the moment of combat 
during combat and uh, he can also uh, improve them permanently uh, just a, a small number of them by applying some uh, upgrades and power-ups mm -hmm. out of combat. All right, I can go. I can. De I can definitely go with that. Um, it's just part of the reason I ask these kind of things is it's is spellcasting is one of those things where I could easily see people getting excessively defensive with it, given yeah. how, given so often that there's a, that it's a limited um, resource and the and the whole eight hour rest thing has no, evolved uh... into involved into a meme in and of itself. Yeah, it's it's different here because uh, because you have stamina that's common for everyone, and uh, spell casting is part of the realistic combat. So, for example, if you are a spellcaster and someone attacks you with a sword, and you get a reaction, you you get to cast a spell as a reaction. So, it's a it's a similar mechanism like uh, melee fighting. For example, a person attacks you with a sword, and you get to cast a teleport spell to to flee, and you roll a contested roll to see what happens first. And if you succeed, you, you teleport first, and the uh, strike misses, and the attack misses. So spells are not are very. Uh, you cannot go on without spells if you're a spellcaster. You can use a weapon, of course, and help yourself, but it's not something like in other systems that you get to cast a couple of spells and then you're out. You use magic all the time. All right, I I got that. And when it com when it comes to that, something I'm cu something I'm curious about is is there is there the possibility that so that um somebody could use these systems that you have to do a bit of a gish character? Um, if you're not familiar with the term, gish is a is a bit of a shorthand for char for characters who um can can do can do sword play and magic. You know, or er early Really early editions of Elves is one of the classic examples of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because I I, I wanted that to happen, and uh, you know I always liked in the Lord of the Rings when Gandalf uses the sword. I always liked that <laughs> because I think it makes sense. But uh, it's possible uh, you can also have some sort of multi-class combinations. I call them hybrid paths, and you can choose them. They are pre-made templates of. Uh, you know um, combinations, but also if you use a weapon, then nothing um, forbids you from using a weapon, regardless of path. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be you can be very effective because it's a little system, and you get to do damage. And uh, so, if you attack another another target and you successfully strike, you might as well kill him. You know, because for example, if two experienced warriors fight each other if a third person uh, joins the fight and attacks uh, one of the targets who is already um, you know occupied mm. uh, he won't be able to defend himself regardless of skill it, it will be very difficult to have enough stamina and reactions to effectively to effect, effectively fight against two or three targets so they, it doesn't have even if you are a spellcaster, if you are using a weapon, uh, in most cases you will you will strike, and you will uh, deal substantial damage. Mm -hmm. Now, I've I've gone I've gone a bit I've gone. The other thing that I saw when I looked at the blank character sheet that I was that I was curious about is um, war rights. Yes. Now it, uh... I know it's in the same section as rituals on on the um, on the sheet, but how similar and how different would they be would they be to rituals? They are a smaller version of rituals. Uh, the the bonuses, the 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 benefits you will receive through a war right are are a bit lesser in terms uh, of effect, but they are also faster most of the times, and they don't really require components. Only in some cases they might require components. But for example, if a ritual is something that a spellcaster can do to, I don't know, uh, cause an earthquake in a village or a flood or something like that, which is a major catastrophe, a war ride would be 
the character would do a ceremonial sort of dancing or or war painting on their body like uh, some native races mm -hmm. uh, used to do and gain some bonuses and effects it's a much lesser effect but easier to accomplish easier to to, to gain all right I it's in the same, it's okay. in the same concept I mean, you you do a ceremony for something mm -hmm. And you get an effect out of it, but it's it's a lesser scale. All right. Now, when it um, when it comes to when it comes to think things like adv things like advanced maneuvers, I'm guessing that's what that's one of those things that you would gain based on a, a path. And yes. is it a is it a case where where you where um. You'd only get you'd only gain them after after reaching experience thresholds, or could you buy um, advanced manu Could you buy or tr or get trained in advanced maneuvers in mo in more than one way? I I changed my mind a lot in that regard, and uh, first uh, a player could do both. They could get them uh, through mastery mm -hmm. by training, and, and uh, they could get them in game by other trainers in cities and stuff, but no one did that. No one ever did that. And I, I started um, uh, I started to believe that it wouldn't work that way. So I left it only um, in paths, something you can develop by practicing and you get to unlock them uh, via mastery. And it's not an uh, external thing that you can learn in game. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, I did, I did want to, did want to pivot a bit into the, a bit into the well lore of a, of a place like me, of a setting like Meteor Tales. Yeah. Um. Now, when I look, when I looked, up, when I was doing research on on Meteor Tales, and I obviously, obviously, I came across your site, um. And I came, I came across the uh, sub the sub page about the world of Vita of Vitalia. Yeah. Um, would it does Meteor Tales take place in that setting, or does or does it have its own setting that it's that's going to be focused in? Meteor Tales, the default setting is is the world of Vitalia. Mm -hmm. uh, the default setting is that, but you can you can use it for other worlds if you want. You, you yeah. can adjust a few things and just change it. But yes, I used as a default setting the world I've created, which yeah. is the world of Italy. Now, obviously, it's impossible to to um to put to put down the a entire world's lore in just the span of a few minutes. But what can what can you tell me about the st about the style of about some of the quirks and some of and some of the approaches that 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 um, Vitalia has. <laughs> Okay, that's that's a bit tricky. <laughs> um, uh, the world of Italia is. Um, hmm, how would I start? Well, I'll start. I'll start with some. I'll start with something a little bit e a little bit easier to to narrow it down. What can you tell me about the technology level? Okay, that's uh, actually that's a medieval setting. Medieval setting uh, with magic, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't even have gunpowder or something like that. It's a, uh, it's a bit before that. Yeah. Uh, I decided not to use uh, gunpowder, so it's a classic medieval setting in that case. Mm -hmm. And um, although I have many races and a lot of magic and stuff, when when you get to play and travel the world of Italia, uh, you'll notice that it's not as high fantasy as it looks. There's a lot of monsters, there's a lot of creatures and everything, but everything is in low volume. Mm -hmm. So I wanted it to look realistic, and if you look deep enough in the dark places of the world, you will find all this stuff, the fantasy stuff. Yeah. And when it com when it comes to when it comes to the the particular setting, and since you mentioned the magic, I um, something I'm curious about is how common is magic is it a case where magic shops could can be seen in in major cities or is it a case where it's of where it's still a very out there concept in most of the world magic is pretty rare 
and uh, that that has to do with the, with every kingdom. So a lot of things in Middle Tales they have to do with the kingdoms mm -hmm. and uh, how different they are. But the magic in most cases is very rare, apart from one kingdom, which is uh, a magocracy and it's very um, it's very rich in magic. But uh, in most cases, yes, magic is rare. So um, you get to see it in parts of the world more, uh, but it's a limited uh, amount of places. Yeah. And to to that end, I'm get I'm guessing that instead that um that all. Although you might see, although you might see it with certain relig certain religious organizations, it's a very it's one of those things where you where um where if some or if nobody's going to outright announce that they're a mage because they might get some sideways glances. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Um, yes, you have to um, to um, to study the the lore of each kingdom to see. Uh, how people will react because there's a lot of history. There was uh, a time uh, where there was some some something similar to witch hunts, and the uh, magic was forbidden in most parts of the world. But that whole thing dissolved, and now it's okay to use magic again. But in some places it's very frowned upon. In other places, okay. Um, there's no real uh, distinction between religion and magic and divine magic and arcane magic i don't use these terms a lot i uh, i don't use this um because many games use these two uh different categories but i've got other other types of magic anyway i think <clears throat> i don't know if i understood correctly or if i answer correctly <laughs> I think I think it I think it I think it answered pretty well. Now, with that with that kind of with that kind of thing in mind, when I when I looked at the demo material, I did see the um, the city of the city of Saria, and I'm I'm curious if in the full book there's there's going to be um, other examples of of full on um, cities. In the in the main book, the core rules there are no cities. Um, I, I have different. I have separate lore books uh, on the website. You can get the whole kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, there are like sixteen kingdoms. So you, I make one book for every kingdom. It's like fifty pages each. Uh, it was either that or create a huge book for the whole world, which would be like a thousand pages. <laughs> so I might do that as well. But uh, you get to use. Uh, you get to buy the the lore books separately. Mm -hmm. And uh, each lore book has uh, handmade maps for each city, and uh, it, it helps a lot uh, as a walkthrough. And um, it has their own; uh, it has its own uh, maps and lore and history, and uh, the royal families and uh, all the social classes and unique items and recipes and everything. So each book is a supplementary book that really helps. When it comes to gameplay, and within the within within all of that within all of that, when it comes to now, when it when it comes to, I want to shift I want to shift to the paths again to cut to to cut co to cover one map to cover one specific matter, yeah. and that. And that is, is it a is it a case when some when somebody's doing a path where every experience threshold they're getting this one they're getting this one specific thing or would or would they have wiggle room to um ver to vary around? No, they get one specific thing, mm -hmm. uh, and the only difference is that um, if some I've made up. Um, I decided to add something. It's not in the official book, but I'm going to add it as a patch or something at some point. If you develop your character and it reaches the maximum level and you get all the benefits, if you continue playing and get more experience, you get to choose a second path, mm -hmm. relative path though, and start anew. But when you develop, you get one thing. 
All right, that make that makes that makes sense. That makes sense. It's it's one of the, it's one of those things that I'd that I'd want to see. I want to see, especially since you had you had mentioned that you're not doing classes. Yeah. Um. Now within now, within that one of the one of the things that I saw when I was looking at the blank sheets is that you have an entire page dedicated just to crafting. Was that something that you wanted to emphasize so that people, when it comes to having a crafting system, since it's one of those things that I see a lot of I see a lot of games kind of skimp on. Yeah, I um, I created a crafting system that has a lot of stuff. And if you choose, uh, if you decide to have a craft skill, you should be able to keep up because uh, it takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It's not complicated or anything, but it takes a lot of work in game as well. So, a character that spends time crafting an item will not spend that time practicing, for example. So, you get to choose how you spend your free hours and which fields you decide to develop. So, a character that has a crafting skill and uh, another skill and uh, magic and uh, a sword and uh, all these sort of different fields. Mm -hmm. They have to distribute their time accordingly, and it and will and you will develop in all fields, but at a much slower pace. Mm -hmm. So you get it's like multiclassing, you know. So you get to develop a very slow, but uh, with crafting you can perform miracles. You can do a lot of stuff. And I, I, I never liked minor abilities and minor uh, effects. I, uh, if, if you see, if you read the game, and if you, if you notice, you'll see that everything, every spell and every item and every ability have very, very severe effects. Mm -hmm. So, yes, crafting is very important. And if you use it effectively, you, you will have a huge advantage over many things. It gives you a whole new variety of options. All right. Now, when now when it comes when it comes to when it comes to crafting, and now obviously, 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 there's go obviously there's going to be the chemical and more and more horrible types of um, crafting. But since I see that um, blacksmithing is one of the is one of the um, potential crafting skills. Is there the possibility that somebody could use the crafting system to create customized weapons and armor? Yeah, sure. It's uh, it's not uh, it's not difficult to, to to even do that, and you get and also you get unique recipes from different uh, supplementary books, and you, of course you're free to create your own mm -hmm. uh, recipes. It's very easy if you get the sample formulas that I provide. It's very easy to to create your own. Because you know you just need the uh, the materials, and uh, you adjust the weight that comes from the weapon. It's very easy to make a custom weapon mm. or armor or something like that. And uh, blacksmithing is very important because, for example, in Metal Tales, magical items are not a very frequent occurrence. It's it's very rare to find a magical item, and uh, magical items are very powerful. They, I don't have all these lesser enchantments that the other games have. So if you have, uh, if you do find a magical item, think like the Lord of the Rings universe. You find a magical item, it's a big deal. You know, it's a big mm -hmm. deal. It changes uh, the balance of everything. So a blacksmith is uh, can be very effective when everyone just has, you know, uh, normal weapons. Because if a blacksmith is able to make uh, a finer quality weapon with a small uh, modifier bonus or a, a supreme quality blade, Without an enchantment, just a just better damage modifier. It's very important in the game. Yeah, or even better durability and stuff like that. Now, when I look when I looked at the um, when I looked at the base skills on on the blank sheet, um, when it came to the theoretical skills, I saw I saw I I had saw a um, saw a letter code with a lot of them, like D in front of astrology. Um, yeah. L in L in front of um, in front of in front of um, Ray, Ray Ka, um, yeah. S in front of history. What is what is what is that code um, denoting? Yeah, it's um, it's a category of the skill. For example, L is languages, so Ray Ka is a language. Uh, S is sages, sage skills. 
sage history, sage religion, stuff like that, and this divination skill. Mm-hmm. It's like it's a it's a number of skills that fall under the, the same category. And I'm get and I'm guessing the last one is um for is for performances. Fine arts, I guess, mm-hmm. and music and stuff. Yeah, FA or something like that. Yeah. Now, when it come now taking taking that taking that into taking that into account, um. And given given the fact that you met, you mentioned that magic items are a are a rare occurrence, um, yeah. Even with even with that, are there going to be a, are there going to be a few examples of of magic items in the book? And is there going to be the possibility of a of the GM being able to create mm-hmm. custom magic items? Yes, it's very easy. And of course, in the game, you have in the craft skills, you have enchanting. Mm-hmm. Which gives you the ability to enchant weapons with magic, and you can see a lot of recipes, so you can use them or create your own. It's very easy. Mm-hmm. It's very easy. Yeah, it's it's one of those it's one of those things that I could I could see happening, especially since some GMs like to tailor their magic items to the campaign that that is sure. going on. Sure. Oh. Or do or do something or do something to the extent of ha- having a whole quest around ju- around just one sword, and that sword may or may not be a XP for Conan's Atlantean sword, but I'm not okay. I'm not <laughs> I'm, I am not I am not going to incriminate myself in that. <laughs> now, you would sh- now um if I'm not mistaken, you're shooting for about. Four hundred pages for the core, for the core book. Yeah, I already made that. Yeah, it's done. Uh, it's four hundred pages because it also includes the, all the monsters. So it's mm-hmm. two books in one. Because I needed monsters for some other elements of the game. They are core element of the game. For example, there's a path, a spellcaster that uses beast magic. So you must have the beasts. You must provide the monsters. For the storyteller and the player, so I uh, so I provided the 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 monster book within the core rules. It's four hundred pages long. All right, that that makes that makes sense. That makes sense. And I'm get I'm guessing that the full the full book will be um will that will be properly bookmarked. Uh, in, in yeah. In terms of the PDF version. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you had you had said you had you had said that it's that the um the manuscript is more is more or less done. It's just getting the fi- it's just getting the final push. No, the, the 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 book is actually ready. I mean, the 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 book is available on the website, and uh, the Kickstarter campaign is to um, enhance some elements. In terms of, uh, for example, I already have the the game available, and uh, many people have bought it. And uh, but it's a black and white version when it comes to print version. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wanted to make a Kickstarter to add color to most of the illustrations, and also create some props like um, miniatures for all the original races and all the monsters, if possible. So the game. Is in its final version. It's already available, but I wanted to create some better versions and some color versions that I don't have full color and stuff like that. All right, that that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and now this now this ostensibly is the is the second edition of it. Yes. What were um, what were so. Obviously, the um, obviously, obviously, I I won't be able to look into the first edition. But what were some of the takeaways that you had shifting from your 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 initial first edition to this second edition? Was it just was yeah. it a case where certain things had to be overhauled, or is it just a refinement of what you already had? Well, the first edition was a limited uh, number of copies that I printed, like twenty copies that uh, went out to a few people. Mm-hmm. That wanted to to try the system because it was a huge venture. The whole thing to try this 
uh, interactive combat system, it was it was very risky. The whole thing, the possibilities of action versus reaction, and the side effects and the and the bugs that came, you know, that might occur were uh, endless. So I had to beta test that that thing alone for, for for a lot of reasons. So the first edition, the main difference was that the uh, the reactions were um, uh, were predetermined. I mean, you d you couldn't do everything as a reaction. You could do a limited. I mean, every every option in the game, every maneuver, and every spell had a uh, had the uh, had, had a category that said either for action only or for reaction only. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't perform a melee attack as a reaction to an attack. You could only block, or you could only dodge, or you could only you could only cast a barrier spell, but you could not cast a fireball spell as a reaction. You know, mm -hmm. it was a. There, it was already determined, so I didn't like that. But it, that was the first edition. Like, it was prim, it was more of a template-based thing. Like a like a now pilot. Yes, like a pilot. Yes, it wasn't a, an actual uh, edition available, uh, widely available. You know, everywhere. It was a, a limited number, a pilot of limited uh, copies. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, and of course, and of course now, now, we're, now it's getting a full, now it's getting a full on, um, a full on second edition. And I do, I do want to make clear that I, I will be looking forward to seeing how, how this, um, how this turn, how this turns out. Thank now, with, now given, given the amount, given the amount of progress, would it be fair to say that. And for and just for the sake of this, I need to make sure I don't jinx anything. So knocking on wood. Yeah. Um. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Are you thinking spring? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's safe to say spring. Yeah. And I can I can definitely see that. And I, and like I said, I'll be lo I'll be looking forward to it because more variety within the tabletop scene is all is always nice. Yeah. Oh. But with the, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come to come all the way up to the temple. Oh. Thank you very much for your invitation and thank you for looking through the whole thing thoroughly mm -hmm. and researching and paying attention to all these details. I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. My pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and I would like to 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 make a gift and I send send you a paperback copy, anyways. So please write your address, and I will send it over to oh, you. I, I, def I definitely appreciate that. Um, <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>